Well, on behalf of everyone that is involved with the Dairy Innovation Hub, whether we're at River Falls or Madison or Platteville, I thank you for spending uh, part of your day with us, either in person or online. I remember that if you have questions, we will have time for a question and answer at the end of our panel discussion. I, and you can tap them if you're online. You can put those in the chat function anytime. I, now, when the idea of DIH was first envisioned, I, so back in, I, realistically, 2017, 2018, I, dairy industry was not in a bit of an economic downturn. So our leaders and legislative I, individuals wanted to do something big to help. And that's really I, where the research and innovation plays a big role in that story. So, the hub concept includes everything, whether it's farm to fork, uh, everything from farm to fork, whether it's dealing with the animal, whether it's dealing on the processing side, I, whether it's in terms of human health or economic uh, health and vitality. So to this end, obviously the interface between business and uh, the university can be a driver of regional economic development. I, for those businesses and a source of data and education for everybody involved. So I'd like to welcome John Umhafer, I, who will moderate our uh, panel discussion here with a group of business leaders who are leveraging university innovations uh, to make their businesses better. So John is the executive director of the Wisconsin Cheesemakers Association. For more than 130 years, John has been Not there that long. long. I, Wisconsin Cheesemakers Association has served as the voice of cheese and dairy manufacturers, processors, and marketers. I, John also serves on the Dairy Innovation Hub Advisory Council as one of several uh, key trade organizations that have supported the initial concept uh, in 2019. So please join me in welcoming John, and he will introduce the panel discussion. Sure, sure. Thank you very much, Steve. My first round of applause. That's great. I've been on the job uh, not 130 years, but 30 years in this role. So uh, it only took four of us, I guess, to march across those 130 years. Um, Wisconsin Cheesemakers Association is the trade association since 1891 for the dairy processors, for the cheesemakers the butter makers, the way makers in the state. We've got 600 plus members uh, all around the country though. We've grown, especially in the last uh, 20 years. We found that we're a unique organization. We lobby and, and advocate and train on behalf of dairy processors and fill a niche that uh, people from Hillmar Cheese in California have found useful to Cabot Cheese in Vermont. So we're Wisconsin Cheesemakers Association, but we've literally got every cheese company now in the United States uh, under our membership. So it's exciting for us. We're touching 36 states in the process. So just a little background on Wisconsin Cheesemakers. We fit in because this is the end of the chain here, the supply chain. This is, uh, you heard a lot of great research on the farm. Uh, heard Dr. Scott Rankin talking about uh, lactose and, and the products of uh, yogurt making in that uh, acid way. So here we are at the end of the food chain serving the customer. Wisconsin, you know, still is the number one cheese state in the United States. Woo! Thank you, Karen. We is still, we make 50% of all specialty cheese, value-added cheese in the United States. And there's a figure that's out there that comes from uh, the university, so it's got to be right. It's a $46 billion industry when you look at it from an economic driver perspective. And I've always heard numbers like that, and I thought, well, okay, 46 billion. But if you just take the 3.5 billion pounds of cheese made in Wisconsin and set them in a retail store, you're going to see at least a $4 a pound price on that. Mild cheddar everywhere up to Parmesan is going to be even more. So $4 is cheap. So that would be $14 billion cash right there on those 3.5 billion pounds. So when we talk about multipliers and is that a real number, right away, and if you add butter in, ice cream, whey, you're up to cash on the table, $20 billion industry. And then the multipliers do make sense because that cheesemaker turns around and hires an electrician in the state. He buys a cheese vat. 
he buys milk from his dairy farmer and that money circulates. It, it's possible when you get to 20 bi million or billion, excuse me, that that multiplier is not even big enough. So big industry in the state. And I have some people here that play a very important role. I'm gonna start with a state senator here in the heart of uh, this part of the dairy industry and I'm gonna have them introduce themselves. So Senator uh, Staffshow, please say hello to everybody. Well, good afternoon. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I am Senator Staff Schultz. I, I actually grew up on a farm just north of here, a little ways between Hammond and New Richmond. Still farm there with my dad. Uh, he's 81 years old. I'm hoping someday he lets me drive the combine, but it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> uh, did not grow up on a dairy farm, but grew up you know, just down the street and rode bikes to the neighbor's house and, and milk cows with them. So uh, I'm glad to be here and, and glad to be a part of this conversation. Thank you very much, sir. Now we've got, uh, let's start with Paul Bauer on the end. Tell us who you are, Paul. Go green. Okay, first, pass the first test. I turned on the mic, so that's good. I just have to share, my dad had a heart attack. I had to plant corn. I swear he's going to have another heart attack when he had a harvest because the <laughs> nicest thing he ever said was, yeah, that wasn't too bad. Yeah. So, yeah, so I get that. I get that. Paul Bauer, Ellsworth Cooperative Creamery. Uh, we've been uh, around since 1910, so not quite as long as the cheesemakers, but we're, we're trying to make up time here. So uh, we have uh, approximately 220 members, both in Wisconsin and Minnesota. Uh, we have three plants, one in uh, Ellsworth, a brand new facility in Menominee, and a processed cheese plant in New London. We employ about 350 uh, people throughout the state, give or take, I can't actually keep track. Uh, but as John said, uh, one of my pet peeves is in, and uh, the state has been much more responsive to it, is Wisconsin, our little plant alone, I know I do a seven, like a seven multiplier. We have about a $2.8 billion impact to the area that we serve. As a co-op, every dollar that we earn or spend goes back to the community. It's not going out to some foreign country. The profits all stay here. So. We're very proud of that, uh, also being the cheese curd capital of the world. So we're very happy about that. Good start. Ken, Ken Hyman's here. I'm Ken Hyman. Oh. I'm Ken Hyman. I'm the eldest of the three brothers at Nasonville Dairy. We have uh, five sons that are there with us. We are a little bit diversified in the fact that we have two cheese plants. Not a big deal there, but we also, in addition to that, have a milk bottling plant where the oldest uh, producer handler in order 30. In addition to that, we um, have a farm. We milk 500 cows, so we supply all the milk to uh, to our bottling plant. And uh, we've used a lot of the innovation that we'll talk about today as well. And it's worked well for us. And we believe very strongly in the things that are to come and what we need to know in the future. So I'll turn it back to you, John. Sure, so we had a talk the other day, and uh, the senator, you did a good job of kind of putting uh, bumpers around this conversation, and that was, l let's talk about this in terms of what these universities, and I want, I'll get to the hub, but really it's these ag universities that we're talking about here, Platteville, River Falls, Wisconsin, uh, down in Madison. Um, they play a role in the rural community here that impacts beyond just the people they serve, and I, and I think you see that lawmakers need to understand that, and even taxpayers need to understand that, that these play a big role in their community. Yeah, I'll, I, <laughs> I, I sometimes find that I, I'm the reality check in the room and, and I'm a farm kid at heart, so please don't, uh, you know, I can play the devil's advocate, but that's not necessarily my position. But what we were talking about was in the Capitol, there's 33 say senators and there's uh, 99 state assembly folks. And so there's 132 legislators and uh, my friend, Representative Travis Channels in the back back here, but other than Travis and myself, there's maybe, out of 132, there's maybe six that have some kind of agricultural uh, affiliation. Uh, more than that, maybe grew up on a farm, but they're not actively engaged in, in agriculture. And so when you think about things like funding uh, the Dairy Innovation Hub, when we go into a room, we're, we're by far in the minority. And so when we talk about that, one of the things I think is important for the folks in this room to consider is we have to answer to a group of people that don't, they don't love farming like we do. And so they say, uh, you know, what's this, the third round at seven or eight million, we're at 21 or $24 million. Uh, what do you have to show for it? Uh, why is it important for a taxpayer 
Uh, I live up by New Richmond, and a lot of people know this part of the country. There's St. Croix County is the second fastest growing county, uh, so there's a lot of rural housing developments, and you have people that have no agricultural affiliation living in the middle of some really nice agricultural land, but they want to know, why would we spend my tax dollars on that? Why, why does it matter for me? And a part of that conversation is what these gentlemen just talked about is, this is how much uh, revenue is generated in my community. This is how many jobs for non-on-farm people is generated. This is what we have to show. And then also, uh, Travis and I were talking the other day, for the folks that are on-farm, we need to show the return on our investment. You know, if, if you're a farmer, you're also going to want to know why is it important to keep this uh, and why, why is this a good thing. Uh, we talked a long time ago when this was brought up, about farmers are, are incredibly efficient, and unfortunately that means that due to supply and demand and pricing, a lot of the prices sometimes will be lower than the folks in this room would like. And the way that you change that is you, you're not gonna reduce supply because we're so efficient, especially here in Wisconsin, so you have to increase demand. And I really believe that the Dairy Innovation Hub uh, can contribute to growing our markets in other areas, other countries, uh, other products, so it's critical to make sure that we think about that as we go forward in how, how does this return to the community, to the taxpayers in the state? Uh, and I think that's kind of what I bring to the, the conversation here today. Yeah, I agree. I want to do kind of a combo with you two gentlemen. Uh, we talked at the table about maybe just a glimpse of how things are going out there in the market right now. And then kind of roll from that. Paul, I know that you do a lot here with uh, River Falls and, and you know students and, and interns and hiring and so start off with house sales how's it going and then kind of roll that into how you use uh, the ag campus here as a incubator well we're actually doing quite well um, I I love our customers I appreciate everything that they do for us especially when they pay the bill but uh, we've been on a 20% growth in our most profitable items. And I'm gonna tell you, it's sometimes exhausting because we're doing a major expansion about every other year just to keep up. And that sounds really great, but there's all the nuances that go with that and we need talent to make that work. COVID hit, oh my God, that's just such a game changer in there. But we were able to grab about six graduates from UW River Falls. We work very closely with Michelle Farner. I can't wait for the pilot dairy plant to get going. Uh, I'm glad they put more innovation in there because it's not just turning milk into cheese anymore. It's about the way. It's about the wastewater. It's about making sure you make that make cheese to the dairy's dairy customers' expectations and making safe quality food to get that extra value out of it. So I'm very proud of where our co-op has come and grown and um, we work very hard to make sure that our margins are basically double or even higher than that uh, than our peer co-ops in the industry. So I'll put a note in the middle. Uh, the hub again is funded by the legislature and people like me and, and people like these gentlemen and you we're happy to go to Madison and testify, and you know Paul would be a heck of a good good at that, and Ken is too, to tell the story of why the processor side knows that we need to keep this going as the hub. So I'll have Ken jump in. How's it going for you, and how do you use, well, you really work with two universities. You do a lot I, in Madison right. too. Right, we do a lot in Madison, but the head of our QA department is a graduate from here. Head of our uh, human resources is a graduate from here. The head of production is a graduate from here. Yes, we, uh, and this last year we spent, we were fortunate enough to have one of the students come in as a summer intern to work with us, <clears throat> looking to find what avenue they chose to look at in the future. What do we want to see? You know, what's coming today is, is just spooky. There's so many changes out there. Yeah, I mean, we take a piece of cheese and we used to refer to it as this or that. Now that we're beginning to go to other parts of the world and do all kinds of things all over the world, we have to adjust to what these people are making. So what we're looking to the UW River Falls for is the people who can help us adjust to that. In other words, you know, we make all these changes as Paul's referring to, some on the fly, some with calculated intentions, and no matter what we do, it's gonna cost. And we try to make sure that it's right. I mean, we, uh, I mean, I guess if I pick on one that would be primary to me would be the idea that 
we hold a patent on Blue Marble Jack. Okay, no big deal. It's a Monterey Jack that instead of taking 90 days to develop the penicillium rook 40 veins in it, we do it in four hours. All right, okay, fine and dandy. That's just great. But when you look at that, the first one's out. I could have called the first chief Smurf cheese. It was as blue as blue could be, you know. <laughs> we, I mean, there, there's mistakes made every day when you're doing experimenting like this. And uh, to have the people who have the interest and have the knowledge to make this all work and to see what's going to be next is just unbelievable. So we need these people. We need them badly. And we, the, the workforce is in such, we have to look at today, you know, I'm getting old, er, by the minute. And anyway, what we're looking at today is we need these young people to have the, the enthusiasm and the, the want to know. I mean, we, right now, uh, I, I, Michelle is here, but down at the Center for Dairy Research, we have Yagi and we have uh, Mark Johnson and we have Dean Summers, and these gray hairs are getting to be gray haired too. And uh, we need the next generation to step up. Even that Scott Rankin's getting old, you see him? <laughs> Scott's still here? Sorry, Scott. But yeah, you know, you, you jump ahead to something, and I'll, I'll, I'll follow you there. Um, the hub, to me, feels like not just this opportunity to rejuvenate what some decimation in departments in these universities, but also it's also all seems to be next generation, which is really neat to see. Because like you mentioned, there's some great minds at all these universities, but this really infused a bunch of young people, and I think you saw it this morning. So hopefully you guys can take advantage of that. Um, and then your kids will take advantage of it, or in the next generation of the co-op will take advantage of it, because we've got some people in their you know, 20s, 30s, and 40s here that are coming online with the hub. So I want to circle back to you, Paul. Tell us the products that you make and how they, they fit into, uh, you know, we heard Scott talk this morning about the innovations he's doing with lactose, but you've got some innovative cheeses. Um, how, how does the universities come into play, and how could the hub research come into play? You'd, you don't make those in a vacuum, I assume. You well, we, we don't, and um, w my goal is to take the, the milk that we get from our farmers and make the most value I can out of that. And sometimes we get some byproducts out of that, and we actually use CDR as well. Uh, the problem is, is they got such a backlog to get in there that's kind of, you know, we, we need more resources to move faster. but. The reality is, is we have a global marketplace. And um, I think what we're referring to is we have a product that's kind of, we, we actually launched it already once, but uh, freeze dried cheese curds. And it's like, oh no, freeze curds, cheese curds should be, you know, fresh and squeaky. And it's like, we were having a hard time exporting to China because the reality is three quarters of the world does not have refrigeration. Think about that. The world wants better dairy products, and we're trying to jam products that require refrigeration to them that they don't have. We have to learn and pivot to provide products and innovation that our customers not want, not what we're accustomed to making, okay? We have to do that R&D. <clears throat> now, the funny side of that is, is uh, as we got this product launched and we're starting to get a commercial, the plant burned down. So now we're waiting for the plant to get rebuilt, but we'll get there. But, um, you know, and it's not just that product. We, we have many products that go overseas besides cheese curds. We have whey, uh, we have Munster. Uh, we have to learn that, you know, not every country likes bacon and uh, Colby. They, you know, bacon is not good in most of the world. So you have to learn to adjust your labels, bilingual, uh, I'm going to tell you, it goes right down to the culture of the plant. I can still remember somebody saying to me when I first got there, why can't they take 50-pound bags of whey? Why does it have to be 25 kilo? And it's like, our customers want it that way. Well, they should just take it our way. And then it's like, we have to reprogram the machine. And it's like, how much does it cost to reprogram the machine? Well, like $1,200. And I said, do it. I'm going to say three quarters of our product is in 25 kilo bags. I mean, we have to learn to adjust. We have to have the people coming through the pipeline that want that that desire to do better and um, be part of something bigger. And we have that opportunity in dairy. So I'm going to jump in there because people 
is, is probably the number one problem on your side. And, and you mentioned, Senator, that uh, you're seeing both uh, rural and city kids uh, coming here. I, and I don't have the stats on River Falls, for example, but I think you're seeing people taking an interest in agriculture that hopefully is happening up here. Yeah, I'm sure the stats River Falls are the highest in the state. Best, the best Senate district, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> so one of the things that I think is really unique in my job that I've got to witness is uh, I'm what I would stereotype as your typical farm kid. You know, I grew up uh, raising corn and soybeans. My neighbor down the road was dairy. That's what I'm a stereotype as a typical farm kid. And what I think is fantastic is over the last probably 10 years, but for sure the last five years, is I've seen K through 12 ag departments really encompass in those, those rural subdivision kids and even the in-town kids. And there's a place in agriculture, that definition is much broader than it used to be. And I think bringing in more people that show value in agriculture as a whole and understand what goes into agriculture and the treatment of animals and the treatment of the plant and, and, and treatment of our water, uh, I think it's really fantastic. And I think K through 12 has done a great job of finding niche markets or niche areas in agriculture to include some of those kids. And then they, you know, they, they've linked up with the two-year programs at the tech colleges and the tech colleges are, have worked really well with the four-year programs. And now uh, a lot of those kids probably don't start out with an intention to be in agriculture the rest of the life and all of a sudden they find themselves in egg classes in high school and now they want to do more. Well, I might go to the tech college for a couple years and, and some of them get off there and, and some of them are like, well, now I'm going to River Falls to, to finish off a, a four-year degree. And uh, I think it's crucial that we keep those talking so that credits transfer from one to the next and that, that we include a population of people that stereotypically would not be maybe included in agriculture. I, I think that's crucial to, to, to programs like this going forward. Yeah, I'm hoping that the hub is an inspiration for kids to walk by the dairy plant here, for example, River Falls, and, and think about a career maybe they weren't thinking about before uh, because of some of the new professors here and some of the new courses they can take. Maybe they'll be inspired um, by you know Grace's course and whatever she's teaching this fall. <laughs> um, but you know, I had an anecdote from Mike Sippel, who's the cheese director for Agripor, one of the top five cheese producers in the United States. And he said he was an ag uh, engineering major here at River Falls many years ago and uh, volunteered to work in the dairy plant back then. And uh, the next thing you know, his whole career leans toward cheese. And he's now one of the biggest cheese producers in the world. So it can happen. Uh, and it happens because we've built these facilities and because we've hired these people. So big advocate of having uh, that sort of stimulus happen. But there's not enough people, is there? We're talking about all the good people you've hired, but probably the biggest thing we hear in our industry is uh, labor's tight. And I, I'm wondering how it's, you two are faring on the labor side. I just asked Ken for help the other day on finding out how to get more um, non-traditional uh, non-traditional English speaking workers in. We're short. We really are. That's probably one of the hindrances we have for uh, growth. Okay. And Ken has a special program, I know. We've been fortunate uh, in one regard. About 15% of our workforce right now is from the Ukraine, and uh, they're super. Uh, one, one of the things is, you know, we, we talk about um, illegal aliens. None of ours are that. But what I'm getting at is the idea that they're here for on these J-1 visas. Unfortunately, they can only be here for the year. That is the bad news. Uh, when they send them here, though, they send us people that have had a four-year degree in college, minimum Bachelor of Science, minimum 3.0 grade point average, have to be able to speak English and can never have had a run-in with the police. And this is what they're sending us. Phenomenal. I mean, I have agri engineers, I have mechanical engineers, I've had physician's assistants, I've had bankers, I've had everything under the sun. The reality of the world is they can make more money here in three weeks on a standard wage than they'll make in the Ukraine a year. I just want to come back, a shameless plug here. Um, a lot of our, our, our college students uh, that graduate from River Falls started in our plant, and we like that. We'll work around college schedules, Applications are online. Uh, it pays $22 an hour. Uh, weekends only shifts were available. Do you make that? We're looking for help. I'm going to need the website. <laughs> Ellsworthcheese.com. 
So, so I bring this up not only just to give you a, a look at the industry, but I think uh, it's an opportunity for the hub as we look for ideas for the hub. The idea of looking at the workforce, where they're coming from, how they should be paid, how they should be housed, uh, how happy are they, how, can we, how should they be trained, I think that's, that's fodder for research in the industry. So I hope uh, anyone who's interested can uh, take up the mantle and keep those uh, people coming to the dairy industry. John, the one thing that anybody that you know of, we are so, so short on maintenance people. You give me electricians, you give me plumbers, you give me <laughs> pipe fitters, you give me anything. We will pay whatever it takes because we can't get them. We can't find them and it doesn't make any difference. We're looking, we're looking at going back to the high schools to say that we will pay these people all the way through school. Just whatever we have to do to try to find a way to, to fill these voids because these voids are getting wider by the minute. And uh, these are things that we look at on a daily basis. And getting products sold, that's a breeze. Creating new products, sometimes a little tricky. But keeping a plant running, whole new ball game. This has turned into a job fair. I like <laughs> But I want to follow that line of thinking because now I hope instead of hearing you know, how you've taken, I want you to be giving, and, and you've given thoughts about workforce, but give them some other thoughts. Ken, I know you've, you've gone into things like A2. If there's anything that you want these universities, these hub researchers to think about to, for the future research, um, I had a few thoughts, but also I know you've done some work that, uh, I don't know, is there enough research on A2, for example? Well, what we've known is that, okay, proteins, everybody out there, we listen to uh, two things. I'll go two different avenues here. First of all, when we came out with margarine at one point in life, it took us 40 years to correct the mistake that we found out that margarine was one molecule away from plastic. Okay, so now all of a sudden it's the best thing in the world for you, which we all knew before, but unfortunately it took a while. Now we're looking at milk. We continue to you know, divest and continue to break that product down, whereby what I'm getting at is, you know, we have doctors out there saying that we, you know, you have to go to goat milk, you have to go to sheep milk, you have to go to camel milk, whatever. It doesn't make any difference what it is, is they have A2A2 proteins, we have A2A1s, we have a mixture, and we, in our bottling plant now, all of our milk is A2A2. But what do we really need to do? What we really need to do is, and Dr. Rankin, I hope, is on it, that we continue to develop, you know, that we get away from the idea that we're causing any digestive problems whatsoever because this is what our communities are looking for. This is what is being portrayed to the children of today. And if we need to make adjustments, the one thing that happens to cheese, Paul knows it just as well as I do, that after so many days, we've, the cultures have consumed most of the lactose in there, so it's not a problem. But here, we still have that. And if we went from having a half of 1% that were ever saying they were lactose intolerant to a number that's getting to be 28 and 29%, and we, well, it's up to us, it's up to you to help us develop what products we're going to make that are going to make this work. And the other part is we use that all over the world. And so if we're in countries that consider themselves lactose intolerant, we need to come up with the products that will match them. And, and let me pivot, and maybe Paul's faced this, and maybe you too can. Uh, the S word, uh, sustainability. I wonder if you've had uh, run-ins either domestically or internationally where companies are saying, buyers are saying, show me, show me how you're sustainable, because I think this is another hub area that obviously stewardship is one of your pillars, but how can that be translated to the processor? I know there's a lot of on-farm work, but these guys are in the front line of having the big buyers say, Show me your sustainability and what does it mean? Well, that's interesting because uh, I, I, Randy's sitting right here. I sit on the dead cap board and I press back on him. What's this, what does the EU want for, what do they mean by sustainability? I've yet to have anybody tell me what sustainability means, yet we're supposed to be sustainable. My other pet peeve is, is if you look at the dairy industry, we're either cheap or very sustainable because we <laughs> reuse energy all the time. Right. And we've been doing it for years, but we'll never get credit for it. One of the things that I really think that I'm going to pivot just a little sure. bit on the sustainability sure. issue is, is that we have a room full of people that really like dairy and are true ambassadors. And we are horrible at promoting our own sustainability 
and what we really do, how well we take care of cows. I don't think people understand that, that most dairy farmers do a better job of taking care of cows than their family. When you look at, well, I grew up on a dairy farm, I get it. Um, I, I, on a personal note, I the youngest kid, the only kid that my dad attended the graduation of from college was me because I was the youngest because my brother was home farming. So I got labeled the favorite, just saying. It, Therapy is not yeah. one of the pillars yeah. of the dairy hub. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> but but I, I'm going to say I've taken this a little step further. When we look at the Menominee uh, location, we laid it out with viewing windows to see cheese being made, Okay. When we're looking at what we want to do for pretreatment, I went with an anaerobic digester uh, and pushed the technology on membrane technology. I mean, it's been around for us. It was pushing it. But uh, to, to flare off the gas, because I believe that that's going to be the next frontier is energy generation from dairy cows. We have a great future. We have a lot of ability. We are horrible at marketing ourselves. So we are sustainable already. We can be more sustainable. We have to figure out how to get that message out. And I'm going to tell you, it's not Ken and I that has to do that. It's the dairy farmer that has to do that because people don't want to hear from us because you guys own plants. They want to hear from dairy farmers. Well, something we talked about in the Hub uh, meeting yesterday was that I think the translators are researchers. I think someone's got to stand between what a farmer can tell them and the data and the consumer and translate that because you said a bunch of words that you know the average consumer wouldn't know about filtration and anaerobic digestion and someone's got to tell them what that means because like you said you're already doing it and you, we just toured your facility because it's state-of-the-art and uh, taking care of wastewater. Ken, does anybody ever bug you about sustainability? Yeah. <laughs> well our, what I'm getting at I guess is it's twofold. We spent a year-long project on lactose. We, you heard about lactose today from Dr. Rankin. And uh, lactose that we're removing from, from milk. All right, if you take corn, if we want to make ethanol, whatever, we're going to have to convert that, all right? We let a cow do it. We turned around, we take the lactose that's left over, and we, made, we actually made energy out of it. Our plant consumes about $63,000 a month worth of energy of electricity and anyway we actually did a complete study on it for a year we spent on it changing our lactose into energy and uh, we could be two and a half times a negative footprint hmm. big thing is my in comparison to what we're paying for energy today it would be ha that would have to be two and a half times more than it is now so it doesn't really work that well but the other one we found with the <laughs> You know, as we're talking about sustainability, we take the lactose now, and the lion's share of our lactose that we have, we condense after removing some of the water, and it goes back to the farms. It's replacing corn so that they have more corn to sell. It's a matter of economics, and uh, makes a tremendous feed. Um, we use it on our own farm, and uh, it's worked quite well. Uh, although we only have a 500 cow dairy, I know that they average uh, 104.6 pounds of milk per cow per day with an extremely high test and extremely high protein. So it works. So is there anything else you'd like these hub researchers to know? We've talked a little about workforce and about sustainability and about well, various topics. But uh, for me, the one I like to soapbox on is exports because I think you know we're already at 17% of the milk in the United States leaving the country. and. Uh, bound for 25 in my opinion and is it going to happen because we send more whey over is it going to happen because we send more uh, uh, cheddar cheese or w w what's going to take that up Paul wh where's your portfolio headed well we we currently have about 20 percent of our whey go to China and I, I have a little different view of that I, I really think we need to export the value added anybody can take a cheddar and take it across the seas and then you're competing against New Zealand and Australia. The real money's in the marble jack that you have. That's where the real money is. That's where we can shine. And there's a lot of steps to get there. And um, we, we really need to, to continue to have the expertise because I will tell you, when you go on buyer's mission, they are envious of our university system they're envious of what we have to offer the industry 
and they know we make really great product. We have a preferred status in the world because of our dairy system that we set up, and we need to continue that and perpetuate that for higher values, not just the commodity values that a lot of it goes out at. Yeah, I, I agree completely. And Ken, I don't know if you have a take on where your portfolio is headed, or is it more of the same? Because you're already making great specialty cheese. But I guess that is. But we were, um, all right, I'll go back just a little bit in history. We export, one of our biggest export areas is China. All right. And uh, they take a, they started out from us. They were buying, oh, uh, a semi-loaded when they first started every, every other month. Well, now they're at two or three a month that type of thing. But here's what happened when we were just really starting to build and grow and whatnot, and all of a sudden you're going, um, President Trump was in, 25% tariff on all products. And I said to him, I'm not paying that 25%. And they said, we're not paying it either. And I says, oh, you're getting a kickback. I got it. And they said, no, no. He says, you forgot something. He said, I said, what's that? He says, you guys already had eight on there. He said, I'm paying 33% is what I'm actually paying. So he paid that much. And I said, how are you justifying this? He said, well, you know Mr. Wu? I said, yeah, I know Mr. Wu, the guy that owns a couple thousand stores that we're supplying over there. And I said, what's the deal? And he said, well, Mr. Wu doesn't believe that he could get the product, the consistency, the versatility, or the quality any place else than he's getting it here in Wisconsin. That was his take on it. And he told those guys, he said, I don't care how you get it done, you just get it done so it works. So they did. So the hub's coming in into an industry that's got a lot of talent already. And on export, I don't think these folks, there's a lot of people that can help them with logistics and trucking and filling out the paperwork. What I would ask of the hub is, is the innovation side, that at the VAT side, the new product, the stretching of the shelf life so it can sit on a boat and cross the ocean. That's where we need the research. So it's a big part of what the future holds. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to swing back around to the senator here because you had a point that you made the other day about not just how the other legislators need to tune into how important ag is, but also your, your tax base. The people that you serve also benefit from ag in maybe ways they don't understand. Yeah, and I'll touch on that, but I first want to mention what something Paul said the other day, and he alluded to it a little bit, and I think it's important for the folks in this room to think about this is you told me that your board doesn't like some of the products that you're developing. And I think that's critically important to, to, to think about. We, we can't just make products that are popular with the people here. You have, to, you have to travel around and you have to see different parts of the world do things drastically different than we do. We wouldn't go there. We might not like some of the things that they serve on their dinner table every day because that's, it's a different culture. It's a different community. Uh, having that that thought process to say, well, it might not sell at the grocery store in River Falls, but it, it might in a completely different country if, if we do it right. That, that's key, and I'm glad you guys are thinking about that. But yeah, we're talking about taxpayers, uh, those of us in the legislature, we go down, and, and so, so for those of you that don't know, the, the process is here in January, we're going to start a new session, and we'll start right off. We jump right into a 85 plus or minus billion dollar biennium budget and everybody fights for every dollar. And so things like the Dairy Innovation Hub uh, is fighting for dollars with people that want dollars for mental health and, and other um, firefighters and, and EMTs. And uh, those dollars are all come out of the same pool, essentially. And so it's not just, you know, why do we need this? Well, because the researchers really need this money to do their research. And, and, and that's, not, that's not an inaccurate statement, but the problem is if for folks like me that go down there and fight for agriculture and fight for dollars for the innovation hub, we need to figure out that taxpayer that maybe didn't grow up on a farm or did and no longer lives there, uh, and he's paying property taxes or he's paying uh, income taxes or whatever, we need to figure out how do we justify to that person, him or her, why this dairy innovation hub is important. So. Part of that is we can all sit in this room and talk about great research, and it, and it is. It's fantastic. You guys are way over my head, I'll be honest. But I think that this is a minority of the population of the state, especially the taxpayers. Um, and we could talk about real estate, whatever. But in the long run, when we go to Madison to fight for the dollars for this, we need to be able to show results. And so part of the task of the Dairy Innovation Hub 
needs to be how do we justify to the rest of the state, to the rest of our community, to the rest of the tax base, taxpayers, why this is good. And I think we hit on that a little bit ago, but um, you, you know, these guys are growing jobs. They don't have enough people. So if you want jobs, this, this market's a little bit different because you know everybody's looking for workers right now. But in general, that's not always the case. And, and these are solid industries with people that have long-term family supporting jobs and they're gonna build that. So the, the, the more product we can send overseas, the more people we need here, the more people we need to be salesmen overseas. It's, it's just an incredible tie-in and we need to be able to answer the question is, for the guy that's not a part of it, why is it important to me? We, we need to make sure that we have an answer for that. Thank you very much. Uh, we need an armed guard for you because you're pretty important to this industry. This, this hub, you know, I want the researchers in the room to know that you are broadly, wildly supported by many, many hundreds if not thousands of people in this industry who see the hub as one of the great ideas in the last 20 years. So do your work. We are here to make sure that it gets translated to that legislature and to, to the citizens of the state. Maria is doing a fantastic job and Heather. And uh, I think that that role falls upon us and you guys just do your great research work. So I think I'm supposed to pivot now to see if anyone has any questions for us and that would, that would wrap us up. Otherwise, I'd love to take a question if anybody had any about, ask a question about cheese. Ask Ken his favorite cheese. I don't even know the answer to that. <laughs> the one with the most water in it. Sell as much <laughs> water as possible. <laughs> if there's no questions, I might surrender the mic back to Steve. Unless you got some online. I, I don't actually, but I mean, there's no questions. Come on. Come on. All right. There's one. You know it's a good panel when we've answered every possible question. That, and they're napping. Oh, hello. My name is Young Miki. I'm actually an associate professor here uh, in the Ag Engineering Technology Department. Uh, my area is process engineering, so I'm very interested in processing side of the dairy industry. And you mentioned briefly about the labor shortage, especially maintenance side of the industry. Um, it is a huge challenge that I see as an educator because that more and more younger generations are not into that kind of field. Like manufacturing, we are lo losing you know a lot of workforce because they, the generation are you know they they kind of think you know the manufacturing is not really appealing to them. And I, but it's a, such an important area. So there is a that that side of the challenge. And another side of challenge is that. They often case the industry adopt the technology very quickly because that technology benefits, have a direct benefit uh, in that industry, and, like make the process more efficient, uh, produces very innovative products, whatever they, that is. And then at an the, the education uh, side, that we have to uh, train our students to be equipped with the skills and knowledge to keep up with that technology advances that's happening in the industry side. So I think it, uh, as an educator, I think there's also a gap in that sense that that smooth uh, uh, conversation between the industry and the educational institutions like us so that you know, we can um, revise our curriculum in accordance to what's happening in industry so that we can properly try to train and as students to be equipped with the right skills and right knowledge. So what, I uh, just want to ask what your take on that, how we can have that more efficient conversation happening in that area. I appreciate that, very good comment. Um, I have heard, and I'll, I might flip this to Ken, but you know, we have people putting in robotics and automation into their plants, just like you said, higher tech, and uh, they, they think they're gonna save some workforce, right? You get rid of a few guys stuffing things in bags, but then the person that has to fix that machine becomes 10 times harder to find than the three people that could move that cheese into that bag. So it's a different problem, right, and a, and a tougher problem. It really comes down to the idea that, yeah, I could replace three people. And if I replace three people with the technology that you're speaking of, that would be great. But the person that I'm hiring to keep that maintained and keep it operational because I can't shut it down. I used to be able, if it would, took three people to do these 
particular jobs, I replaced it with one robotic system. If it goes down, I can't even fix it with six people. Six people standing there won't help me. I've, you know, it just gets to be a, a, a conundrum that we can't live with. But as far as the people coming out of, of the system and understanding it, most, you know, the first thing I think they should understand is the dollars that are being paid for this group of people. I mean, it's good, really good. They are not going to be having to dine on uh, mac and cheese. Nothing wrong with that, but anyway, they, uh, you know, I like cheese. I know, me too. But they, you know, they, it's just that this is what this is what we need so badly. Um, but as far as we, if when Michelle gets everything going here, there's some other equipment that we'd be very happy to um, show you how to lay your hands on that would give people, you know, the day in day out the same things that Paul and our companies are using all the time, and uh, we'd be very happy to allow you to train with that and have that and. I'm sure that the suppliers that want to sell to Ellsworth or Nasonville or Lynn or Grassland or everybody else, yes, they, they'd install it just to make, make sure that we could train people on it because they do have a catch then. They have a place to point to. You can get, our ser you can get a service tech from these people instead of flying them halfway across the country. We put in equipment from, uh, some of our equipment is from um, Italy, some of it is from uh, Germany, some of it is from... Uh, France, and uh, a lot of times the only good news we have is that our worst times would be at night, and they're during the day, so at least we get to talk to them on their schedule. Otherwise, you could just blow the whole place up. I, I would echo that, that automation sounds cool, but when it doesn't work, you're dead in the water, and it's hard to find people to fix it. I, I would rather say uh, when you look at logic control and how systems are working, um, we take a lot of people from high school and they we actually help pay them for their school and help pay for their masters. Thankfully, no one's, no one's asked for their PhD yet. But, um, <laughs> but you know, we'll take good talent and invest in them. I mean, we really will. But to get that good talent, they need to learn the skills of how things work and interconnect and why they work. And... Look at the micro aspect and the big picture aspect. Um, we have a lot of fantastic people that look at the micro aspect and they become experts in that small field. But those that can take that expertise and move it to a larger field uh, are, are very valuable to us and anyone in the industry. And, and, and that's not just on the technical side, it's on the people skill side as well. Because we, at the end of the day, we still have to work with other people. So is the answer at the tech college level, or is it at, you think it's here at River Falls and Platteville and Madison, or is it both? All of it. All, I'm going to say it goes right back to grade school. I'm going to tell you the biggest problem we have with employees right now is showing up. Where do you learn that? Kindergarten. Yep. Flat out. It starts when they're little. And I cannot teach somebody if they don't show up. So that's the first skill. A good attitude helps a lot. And, and then from there, the sky's the limit. I, I would add to that communication. Uh, in, in, the, in the work I do, travel ground, certainly in agriculture and, and retail businesses like you guys, but all across the board, um, employers are frustrated with the lack of ability for the newest hires to be able to communicate. Um, I also own a small business. I hired a young gentleman the other day, he's 20 years old. Honestly, basically because he looked me in the eyes said thank you and shook my hand. It's the first one out of 11. Uh, everybody else looks at their feet, they're checking their phone while you're giving them an interview. It, it, we need to have a conversation about communication as well as showing up. And, and we laugh because it's, to my generation, that's crazy, but it's common. Uh, and we need, to, we need to focus on that going forward, I think. So a good workforce question. Any other result there? Yeah, we've got one more question over here, right? I just wanted to ask, uh, what do you guys 
feelings about, I mean, we heard earlier about the concerns that there might be with large farms, the, a lack of social capital or an adjustment down. And we have also heard about how the consolidation of farms and loss of small farms can affect rural communities by draining them out of resources. Where does that fit in with what you guys do? And I also want to say thank you. I work with lots of small dairies who work with Ellsworth. So we're really grateful that you guys still send the trucks out to the smaller farms. But um, what what impact is growing farms having on the communities and where do small farms still fit in the picture? And these are perfect panelists for this because they are all, they're not city-based, they are out in the rural community. Go first. I get to go first. I guess uh, of the 200 dairy farmers that ship to Nasonville, uh, we have farms as small as, well I should, I have to take the organic farms out of it. Um, so then Anybody that's conventional, the smallest farm has probably got about 12 cows, all right? Largest farm has uh, 2,500 cows. Um, believe it or not, the two of them are two miles apart, and it's just the way it is. Do we, what we see today, what we see today is I don't know. I don't know how we're going to transfer to the small farm. I don't know exactly how we're, gonna, how we're going to incorporate that. Can it be done? Yes. If the prices are right, it can be done. But the sweat equity put into it is spooky. And I don't, the, it's going to be all up to the person. If they want to make a living at it, they can make a living. Will the living be better if they were doing something else? Probably. But I mean, that's up to them. And, uh, but we see today, uh, we know, as I, Paul will allude to, is that we in this country, because of demands and so forth, are going to have to build a 10 million pound a day plant, one plant every year cheese plant to keep up to the demand that we're going to have. So there's going to be room for everyone. It's just a matter of where they want to fit. I'm going to echo that. There's room for everyone, every size. Uh, we ask of our farmers, you got to have good quality. The quality of milk in this country has improved so much. The consistency of it. I can remember when I first started, there's a 20% swing between the 5th of June and the day after Thanksgiving was a 20% swing in milk, and now it's about 2%. Why is that? Farmers are better. They know exactly how to treat those cows. They have great ventilation in there. But again, there's room for everyone. My concern isn't the big farm, little farm. My concern is, is where are we going to get that equity for that next generation to start that's not or it doesn't have, isn't born into a farm? And that's a big problem. And I, I, I'm going to say um, the previous company I helped start, Anago Cheese, was an ESOP. And, and there may need to be looks at farm ESOPs, where farms are handed down to the employees through a tax me mechanism. But if we want to eat and we want to grow, to me, we got to be on the forefront of that. How are we going to take that? Because the, the economics are, if you want to be a viable for a multi, a, a viable farm, without inheriting it, it's going to have to be 500 cows or more. It just is because you're going to need the expertise in there. I mean, you look at a manure spreader. My God, they're telling me that a, a manure spreader is like $100,000. Yeah, on a small one. I mean, you can't afford it on a small farm anymore. So you got to look at the economies of size. I'm throwing 500 out there. It could be whatever the right number is. But that's a lot of money to get 500 cows going. And we're going to have to address that problem sooner than later. Senator? Well, I think people in my position often get somebody that stop us here or there and saying, what are you doing to save a family farm? What, what are you doing to keep the family farm? And it, it just plagues me because, to, to be completely frankly honest and forthcoming with you, my dad and I farm probably just a shade under 800 acres, and we are by far the smallest farmer in our neighborhood, in our township for sure. Um, and so I, I'm a free market guy. I believe in free market economics. And I think that agriculture for decades, decades and decades, has been a very high volume, low margin business. And if you're going to expand your business, you have to get higher volume. And in order to get higher volume, you have to get bigger. It's not pretty, but that's the truth. Now, what I said earlier about some of these niche markets and, and, and things like that and people that are in the suburbs that are now becoming part of agriculture, I think it's a huge opportunity because I see those people 
there's a, a gal north of New Richmond, between New Richmond and Star Prairie, that's got a vegetable co-op. She has, I don't know, 20 acres maybe, and she raises vegetables there. She sells a membership to her co-op to the people in those housing developments and the people in town, and they come once a week and pick up their box of their share of whatever vegetables were ripe that week, uh, and she makes a good living. And I, and I think if we're going to talk about smaller farms or family farms, you know, conventional way of thinking in agriculture, it doesn't work because the conventional way of thinking generates you to a higher, higher volume, bigger farm. You need to think non-conventionally and think about niche markets, niche products. That's what these guys are doing really on a global scale. And if you want to, you know, make it smaller to a smaller scale, you could make a living in agriculture um, on a very small footprint if you can figure out the niche market and, and get your margins back in. So um, it's an incredibly, it's a frustrating conversation for legislators who have been in the field and know that agriculture traditionally has been set up to get bigger over time and now we're busy trying to save family farms and it's just, just it's a different way of thinking. And it fits in, it's a hub pillar to uh, look at the size of the farms and how we can help all sizes. And, and luckily, uh, I'll say this, uh, there's not many states in the United States that have cheesemakers of all sizes, dairy processors of all sizes that are actually seeking small farms, medium-sized farms, large farms. Some of our processors have exclusively gone for large farms. They just f wanna take that efficiency. But it, the smaller you are as a cheesemaker, the smaller you want that dairy farm to be that's working with you because you do not want to have one farm serving you milk. That is too much of a risk. So we are lucky in this state. We still have about 130 different companies making or sites in Wisconsin where cheese is made, about 100 companies, 130 sites. And that's really good for the farming community in the state. Um, better here than Idaho where there's a, you know, third largest cheese producing state and there's eight cheese plants, not 130. So out there you have to be big because there's giant cheese plants. So we're in the right state here to make a difference, I think, and so the hub is well located. But I think that's a pillar. It's something that you really got to work on. All right. Well, that's all Maria's going to let us do. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Steve. Very good. Well, thank you to our panelists. I just got a couple of notes here as we are wrapping up. One thing, if you're a River Falls student that is helping out with the tours uh, and you haven't visited with Laura yet in the back, if you want to head back there, that would be good. Uh, so, <clears throat> again, thanks to everybody for sharing your day with us. I, also for the individuals that were up here speaking. Uh, whether it was on a panel, whether it was the research updates and things like that, I, or if you were asking questions, I, thanks for contributing and uh, making this a good, good day together. I, I'm going to explain some tours in just a second. I, I do want to remind everyone that they will likely be getting an online survey within the next couple of days. If you could complete that, that would be fantastic. I also... The online sessions uh, will be available basically at any point uh, if you wish to go take a look. Uh, if you're an instructor like me and you want to put up something for 10 minutes uh, on a concept that we haven't been able to do before, fantastic. That's what those online sessions are there for. Uh, so there are, believe it or not, more beverages and snacks in the back. Okay? Uh, and we have uh, three different tours for individuals that are interested. Okay? So let me just kind of walk through the logistics of these. I, if you're not interested in participating in any tour, you're welcome to stay here. The posters will be up uh, for another hour and a half, two hours or so. I, Maria said about 3.30, depending on the crowd. I, she's looking at me now saying, oh, I didn't say 3.30. She said 3.30. I, well, I, those uh, posters will be there, hey, I, and uh, you're free to visit. Hey, I, there are two tours on campus. I, one is what we're describing as the analytical lab tour. So that's taking a look at 
water quality, that's taking a look at uh, solid sample analysis, uh, and taking a look at some of the molecular biology uh, equipment. Okay, so that's over in ag science. I, the second on-campus option is the processing facilities tour. So that would be our I, in process of renovation I, creamery. That would be Dr. Grace Lewis's lab, I, I, which she describes some of the work that's going on there. I, and it would also be I, the bioprocessing lab with Dr. Youngmi Kim, I, where she'll be walking through some of the things that are going on there, that's in the uh, ag engineering site. So two on campus, kind of the idea here is the tours, you're gonna have a guide. So if you've ever been uh, to Las Vegas and you saw somebody holding up a sign and then a group was following them, I don't know if we have signs, but that's kind of the general idea. Uh, so it'll be basically 10 minutes at each of the three stations, okay? So. Again, the two on campus, processing, or analytical labs. Okay, etch those in your mind right now. Okay, I, the other tour is off campus at our dairy farm. Okay, that is going to be at three o'clock. Okay, and the campus, the directions to the farm, uh, if you have not been out there in the past, are in your folder. If you didn't get a folder, there are uh, the handouts that are on the table. Okay, are these couple tables here? I did want to point out if you're new to the area, if you open this up and you look and you see Campus Farm, that's a horse. Okay, so uh, the Campus Farm uh, is one of the farms we have, but if you're looking for the dairy, open this up uh, and you will see the Man Valley Farm and there will be directions uh, in there in terms of how to get there. So that will be starting at 3 o'clock. So again, you have some tour options that are available to you. I tell you what, yeah, let's, let's do it this way because the student guides will need to grab some uh, individuals. If you are going to participate in the processing, processing tour, they'll meet you in the back over here on my left. My left, your right, back of the room. If you're going to participate in the analytical lab tour, why don't you do over here uh, on my right, on your left, and that way they can get uh, students kind of moved around. Again, you can do both. You can do none, uh, or you can hang out and then come to the farm at three. Your, your choice on that. I will try to direct you as a, you know, the... Uh, the, the We'll, we'll, we'll make sure that everybody gets to where they're supposed to be. So, in any case, very much I want to, again, thank you for spending the day with us. I, we wish everyone a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday. And as you travel home, please travel home safely. Thank you.